Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We're going to, we're going to, it's five after the hour, so we're going to make sure our speaker has plenty of time. Uh, I want to introduce. I want to introduce Dr. Ron Salinger. Dr. Salinger is Assistant Professor of Surgery at the University of Maryland Medical School. He is an attending surgeon at St. Joseph's Medical Center, and he is our main cardiac surgeon who supports St. Agnes Hospital. Uh, Dr. Salinger is also the Director of Quality and Cardiac Surgery at, at uh, St. Joe's, and he has uh, spent a lot of his uh, time and career on improvements in cardiac surgical care. Uh, Ron is a graduate of Albany Medical College. He did his uh, residency in surgery at Albert Einstein in Philadelphia, and then his cardiac surgery uh, residency and fellowship at the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical Center. Ron uh, practiced in New York for a while, came to uh, Maryland a, a number of years ago, and has really been instrumental in supporting our cardiology and interventional cardiology programs. Uh, one thing when cardiologists refer people for surgery is that we always, you know, look at all the comorbidities, we look at the age, we look at, and we say, well, he's a good 80-year-old. Unfortunately, they don't all look so good when they, Ron finishes with them initially, and uh, we have been looking for ways to improve. They all get better, but they do take some time. <laughs> As anybody who has seen people come immediately out of cardiac surgery, they're sometimes a little bloated. They look, uh, they look like they really have been through it because it is a big surgery no matter what we say. They're technically, uh, they all seem to make it. But one of the things that we've been working on over the years is to improve their recovery, enhance their recovery, and make the recovery quicker and less uh, 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 painful for the patient. And Ron has some uh, great ideas as part of the uh, ARIS uh, overall cardiac, uh, overall surgical program, and now specifically related to cardiac care. So we look forward to some really great insights from Ron today. Thank you, Rich. For, I won't take those comments uh, personally. <laughs> No, you're right, though. One of my uh, professors used to say, well, they're all 80 once you put the cross clamp on. So, <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to talk today. Uh, St. Agnes has just been great for me since I, when I first came to Baltimore. It was one of the first programs that, uh, as Rich said, I, I support the, the cardiology program here, but really the cardiology program, the way I see it, supported me when I came to Baltimore. Uh, because I didn't know any of the referring doctors and really was welcomed here with open arms. And uh, the cardiology program here at St. Agnes, which is the part of the hospital that I really know well, uh, is really a special program. And I think especially as residents and students, you have an opportunity to learn from people that have been part of a, a groundbreaking program in many ways, uh, starting way back when they opened their first uh, chest pain center. Um, and very um, high level care and heart failure and, uh, and other initiatives. So I think you have, you have something very special to learn from as, as trainees. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is something that I think you'll find interesting, particularly because it is a development that's occurring at the intersection of medicine and surgery. It's called enhanced recovery after surgery and it really represents a foundational shift in how we're taking care of our patients in cardiac surgery. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, part of the, I'm lucky to be a board member for the National ERAS Cardiac Society, and it was really my work in quality after cardiac surgery that got that led me into that um, into that arena. And then, and I'm a con an occasional consultant for Edwards Life Sciences. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is fairly simple. Just first of all, to tell you what ERAS is, uh, why I think it's important, particularly in cardiac surgery. I'd like to share with you a little bit of the success we've had with ERAS in a short time in cardiac surgery. And then I think today, anytime you're talking about an innovation in healthcare, uh, you need to address how it impacts overall healthcare costs. And I'd like to share a little bit of that with you as well. So enhanced recovery after surgery is really rigorously applying evidence-based best practice care to every phase of the patient's journey. 
starting from the time they're identified as a surgical candidate through their preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative course until they're home and recovered. <clears throat> and the goal of ERAS is to really look at things through the patient's eyes and try to minimize the physical and the emotional stress of the surgical experience that the patient goes through. We want to optimize their recovery and try to get them back to living a normal life as quickly as possible. And what I hope to impress upon you is that ERAS is not just another protocol or an order set, but it's really a philosophy of care and, and it's really a complete program. It turns out that ERAS is not uh, that new a concept. It was started in the 1990s by a Danish colorectal surgeon named Kellett. And he was basically looking for a way to decrease his complications after colorectal surgery. Um, and he just started doing things in a standard way and in sometimes very differently than the, than the way that he had been taught. And it took a while, but it started to catch on in colorectal surgery because he started to have excellent results at his hospital. And it took about a little over 10 years, the first ERAS protocol for colorectal surgery was published. And in 2010, the International ERAS Society was formed. Uh, and from that point forward, people started publishing on decreased complications and shorter length of stay and improved recovery with enhanced recovery programs. And every surgical specialty started to adapt the colorectal program to their specialty, um, except cardiac surgery was the only one that didn't really take any interest in it. That's really in the last two years that started to change. And in 2019, the ERAS Cardiac Society published uh, this article in JAMA Surgery, which recommended 24 components for an ERAS cardiac program. And each component is separated into pre-op, intra-op, and post-operative phase of care. This is an example of the, this was the first ERAS cardiac program developed. It was at Wake Med in North Carolina. This isn't exactly the 24 components that we recommend, but this is an example of how we divide it into the pre-op, intra-op, and post-operative components. And what we call these components in ERAS is care bundles. So every little intervention is called a care bundle. And the, some of these are fundamental to any ERAS program. We emphasize pre-op education and getting a patient prepared well for surgery. We emphasize something called prehabilitation, which really includes physical therapy, nutritional optimization, and also making sure that the patient has some kind of emotional or uh, psychological support. We shorten the NPO time uh, and we give them, we actually give them a carbohydrate load two hours before they go to surgery so we no longer starve patients prior to surgery. We also try to minimize the amount of opioids we're giving patients so that they can wake up more quickly and be ready to get extubated and ambulate and have quicker return of their uh, normal GI function. We get them extubated as soon as possible. We get them walking, we get their drains out, and we get them discharged. And when we discharge them, we emphasize trying to get them discharged back to their home, not to a rehab. Because what we wanna do is have these patients get back to their families and back to their work and back to their normal life as quickly as they can. And in ERAS, more than ever before, we're trying to make sure that all the care bundles reinforce each other. So what we're doing in one phase of care is not holding us up in another phase of care. For instance, traditional cardiac anesthesia is very, heavy, very opioid heavy. And some people are still using long acting sedatives in the OR. And all that does is shoot you in the foot when you go to the ICU and you wanna wake the patient up, get their get them extubated and have them take deep breaths and get out of bed. So instead, we start talking to the patients in the office about what is gonna to happen to them and what we expect from them when they wake up. So they know that they have to take deep breaths and they know that we're gonna get them out of bed and they're mentally prepared. We talk to them about how we're gonna manage their pain, 
We have them practice on an incentive spirometer preoperatively. And then in the OR, we really limit our opioids by using a multimodal analgesic regimen of many different agents that are not opioids to treat their pain. We limit their IV fluids. And we continue that in the post-operative period. And we think that all these things will lead to increased patient satisfaction and probably most importantly, decreased complications. And if, really, if you get these two things, then you end up with a decreased length of stay and decreased cost. This is uh, another uh, JAMA surgery review article that came out in 2017. And what they did in this review article is they looked at all the hospitals in Europe that had ERAS colorectal programs compared to all the hospitals that had colorectal programs but did not use enhanced recovery after surgery. And what they found is that the ERAS hospitals had a 30 to 50% decrease in their post-operative complications and commensurate decrease in their length of stay. And it was really this Sentinel article in JAMA that, that had our specialty start to look at applying cardi uh, ERAS to cardiac surgery. Now, the concept of ERAS, there's no one care bundle that I would tell you about that you would say, wow, this is unbelievable. Like if you compare it to other innovations in cardiac surgery, like TAVR, for example, blows you away, dramatic. There's nothing like that in ERAS. But the concept in ERAS is that of the aggregation of marginal gains, which is a concept borrowed from sports theory that any little thing you can do to make yourself more competitive than the person you're racing against is going to help you have a victory. And it's the same thing for ERAS. Any small advantage we can give to our patient, and if we give them, especially if we can give them multiple increments of advantage, that's going to add up over time to better outcomes for the patient. And that's exactly what we're trying to do by being rigorous and applying every best practice scenario to every aspect of the care for the patient. And again, our expected benefits and what's been shown by ERAS and other specialties is improved patient satisfaction, decreased complications, decreased length of stay, which I think is less important. And then if you get these three, you'll definitely get decreased costs. So this whole talk, by the way, is about 45 minutes because hour long talks, I think, are are a little too long. I actually, think for, <laughs> I actually think 45 minutes is beyond the attention span of most humans. Um, definitely for surgeons it is, I can tell you. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is pause a couple of times during the talk and just see, because there's no way you're going to remember what I just said 40 minutes from now, um, except for Dr. Planall. Um, so does anyone, anyone have any questions? I think I'd like to encourage you to ask questions, anything Anything about that? It does seem very resource intensive, you know, to try to get all the pre-op education and time spent and then post-op and communicating with the patient. I mean, so those are all people's hours spent trying to keep these people on track. It, you know, it, it, it's, it seems like a tough, tough uh, list to kind of check off. Yeah, yeah. So that is a fantastic... Um, question actually. The question for anyone who didn't hear it is basically how resource intensive is this? Seems like a lot of work. Um, and, and it's a great question. Now there's different kinds of resources and this program as far as capital, it doesn't have to be resource intensive. There are certain ways you can invest capital, especially um, in staff, but you don't need to do that. You could have an ERAS coordinator, which a lot of programs do. Um, but none of the care bundles themselves require a massive capital investment. Uh, some of the things we've done at St. Joe's have required some investment, like we started a, a digitally based educational program to augment our written material so we can reach out to our patients in a, in a, in a um, bi-directional fashion to, to ping them with our educational content when they're at home and they can ask us questions back, and that required some investment. But the main investment, as Dr. Voss pointed out, is in time. So you need, there is an opportunity cost. You need people to devote their time. 
Um, and we were lucky that we were, people have really devoted their time to this at St. Joe's. And I think the key to that, and, and there's no way around that, but the key to that is once we convince people of the philosophy of ERAS and the value it could bring to our patients, people were very willing to devote their time. And you'll see as I talk about our team, when I get to the way we developed our team, which can be, that could be a whole talk in and of itself, um, it's very important to convince the entire institution or the entire, every stakeholder in the program how important this is. Because you can't, this isn't just like, you can't just write a protocol and put it out there and, and be successful. You need the nurses and the CNAs and the respiratory therapists and everyone to embrace this. Um, so why is this important in cardiac surgery? And I think this is all predicated upon doing good surgery. If you take someone in the operating room and you do a bad job and you don't sew your grafts right, then it doesn't matter what you do postoperatively or preoperatively. You're, you're not going to have good outcomes. So you have to have good surgery. But there's more than just doing a good job in the OR. And um, I think if you look at how medicine and surgery interact in the cardiac surgery population, you'll find that there's probably a lot of room for improvement in how we medically treat our patients after surgical revascularization. And people have looked at this. This is a survey of Canadian cardiac surgeons. Now, most cardiac surgeons will tell you that we don't need this. In, not most, but definitely when we started talking about it, a lot of cardiac surgeons would say, we don't need this. We know what medications to put patients on. There's basically three medications you need to put patients on after cardiac surgery. Beta blocker, statin, and aspirin. And then there may be a couple others if you want to get to kind of the more advanced level. But those are the basics of medical therapy. And so it's obviously this is a guideline recommended treatment. After acute coronary syndrome, patients should be on dual antiplatelet therapy. So this guy, Yanagawa, is a, car is a uh, cardiac surgeon, did a survey of cardiac surgeons in Canada and asked them, how many of your patients after acute coronary syndrome that you operate on do you put on dual antiplatelet therapy when they go home? And 47% of surgeons said they do it, 53% said they don't. And this is a clear uh, recommendation in the guidelines, showing that you know, this is just one example of, the, of how we're not really following uh, guideline recommendations for medical therapy after surgical revascularization. This is a study where they looked at five of the biggest trials over the last 10 years comparing PCI and cabbage, and they looked at the compliance with goal-directed medical therapy, they called it. And they had two levels. They kind of had goal-directed medical therapy one and two, and one was just like the most basics that we just talked about. And when they looked at that, they looked at <clears throat> these five trials that you may have heard of, Syntax, Freedom, Pre-Combat, BEST, and Excel, all all big trials, multi-center randomized trials. They looked at the compliance with medical therapy after any kind of revascularization, PCI or cabbage, and they found on average only 60% of patients were compliant <coughs> with any antiplatelet agent, beta blocker, and stat. And this is in the context of a randomized clinical trial. This is pretty surprising. And then they looked at discharge in one year. They looked at the difference between compliance and PCI and cabbage. And it turned out, on the whole, the cabbage patients were about 10% less compliant than PCI. And over time, the surgical patients became less compliant in general than uh, the PCI patients. And this is really the crux of this paper. It's a little complicated, but the x-axis is the difference in compliance between the patients who are treated surgically and the patients who are treated with PCI. And the y-axis is the risk difference in, in the primary outcomes in the trials, which basically means the benefit of cabbage over PCI, which those trials demonstrated. And what they found is over time, as the difference in compliance grew, meaning as the cabbage population became less compliant, the benefit of cabbage over PCI declined. And so this doesn't prove causality, but implies that there may be an association 
between optimal medical therapy and the durability of the benefit of cabbage, and that we may be missing an opportunity with our surgical patients by not following uh, best practice in these patients. Any questions about that? You guys knew all that stuff because that's medicine. Um, so again, if you talk to cardiac surgeons, a lot of cardiac surgeons will say, well, you know, we, our outcomes are excellent and I don't really care about those trials. Uh, we know what we're doing. Our, at our place, we have like SDS um, data that says our outcomes are outstanding and uh, we don't need to do any of this stuff. So again, I question that statement because this is data from every cardiac surgery program in Maryland. And this is looking at risk-adjusted stroke. So this data is risk-adjusted. So if you're, you're a hospital, you're doing the highest risk cardiac surgery patients, um, which probably you're not, even if you think you are. But even if you actually are, <clears throat> that's been taken into account here. Um, so this is the stroke rate after cabbage. These are actual hospitals, all the programs in Maryland, uh, just obviously not with the hospital names on them. So this is the stroke rate, obviously very variable throughout the state. So if everybody was following best practice, this probably would not be so variable. So I'm gonna run through the five, there's five major complications we track after cardiac surgery. Stroke, prolonged ventilation, meaning you're stuck on the vent, and here you see a variability that ranges from 6% to 12%. <clears throat> Reoperation after surgery, a lot of variability, depending only depending on what hospital you had your surgery at. Because all comorbidities and if you're on Plavix, that's all been adjusted for in this data. Renal failure, again, a huge variability in the amount of renal failure we see based only on what center you had your surgery. These are all isolated cabbages. These are no transplants, no ECMOs. This is just, you went in and had a bypass operation. Sternal wound infection, pretty low across the state, which is very good, but still variable. And then uh, potentially the most important uh, data point, risk adjusted mortality. And we still see a lot of variability. So there's something being done at some centers that's not being done at other centers. So if those, if optimal, you know, and having optimal medical therapy and standardizing outcomes, if that's not enough of a reason, we had another reason at St. Joe's that prompted us to put in the time to develop this program. And it had to do with uh, an issue that was written about in this editorial that someone showed me from the New York Times. And this editorial didn't just involve surgical patients, but it looked at patients who had survived a prolonged stay in the ICU and kind of this post-ICU syndrome. And it showed that patients are really traumatized, even if, and these were all patients who had no physical sequelae after they recovered. They went back to normal physically. But for months, and, and for some patients, even over a year afterwards, they had nightmares. They felt abandoned because they didn't have doctors rounding on them every day. They heard like phantom alarms, they, and they couldn't sleep. And they couldn't, even though they were home and they appeared normal, they couldn't reintegrate themselves into their life the way they used to be. So these are basically the reasons why we developed the ERES, cardiac ERES program at St. Joe's. We want better short and long-term outcomes, hard outcomes for our patients after surgery. And we want to decrease the internal kind of psychological trauma that we're causing the patients by doing this big surgery. Well, that's interesting. Oh yeah. So it turns out it wasn't just us at St. Joe's thinking this. Um, starting in about 2018, there was a plethora of articles which had never been written, this topic had never been written about before in the cardiac surgery literature. Um, a bunch of articles came out about the application of ERAS principles uh, to cardiac surgery. 
the whole discipline started to talk about it and write about it. <clears throat> so in, any questions about that, by the way? Dr. Albernaz? Just a, a more of a concrete question. You, know, you were asked, I mean, you make it sound kind of sexy, almost, um, as opposed to um, But in reality, you know, that, that kind of like, I can only speak for the interventionists and maybe a little bit the surgeons. We have, we're the ones who are doing the cases. We have something that we're at the airhead. We are the right guy, we're the right assistant, the right stent, and we get into the whole case thing. But what you're talking about is probably more important than the case, obviously, that I'm going to take care of because they're giving birth on behalf of, is, is relying on the uh, support that you get, particularly at, at our institution, the midwives, because they are the ones that are looking to see if this is on an ACE, on an R, on a beta blocker, on an, all the things you're talking about. Which we, you know, between doing the case, doing the report, and getting to the next case, is kind of out of our purview. Um, I'm not, I'm not, not saying we do that way, but, right. but that's the way it ends up being. So the, the, the key to the implementation of this kind of program is to have somebody in the mid level you know, being coordinated, the actual hands on person who makes things happen. Uh, it's very true. And I think. Um, what you said is, is important. I think that what we see is that the things outside the case are definitely very important. And what it seems to take is, I agree with you, I think it's very mid-level and it actually extremely nurse-driven. I think it's really a nursing program more than anything, an allied health program. But it takes usually a interventional person, surgeon or interventionalist, plus in surgery anyway, an anesthesiologist, to champion it, to, to kind of help develop the program, and then kind of get it rolling. And then you, you really, as a physician, help analyze the data from that point on. Um, but I think that's true. Well, just a quick question. In the Maryland outcomes data, um, has there been any attempt to look at the data based on which hospitals participate in ERAS and which do not? Uh, we have not done that yet, but uh, we were just on a call last night where we plan to expand our ERAS. So our last, we meet, uh, we talk on the phone and then we meet in person twice a year. In the fall, uh, our focus was on ERAS. And now we're kind of gonna try to spread ERAS principles through cardiac surgery in the state. There's probably two main programs doing the most ERAS in the state, but there's multiple programs doing parts of it. So, any other comments? For when you say patient for reoperation, is that just cardiac surgery or is it just any operation that the patient underwent? Yeah, good question. So most of those are reoperation for bleeding. But some of them are in that, there's two metrics in the SAS database. One is re-op for bleeding, but that was re-op for any reason. So patient gets acute cholecystitis post-op and goes back to the OR and includes that. Do you see any difference in results when you compare patients coming uh, from St. Agnes that didn't have the chance to be in your house and be prepared for more prolonged pre-op evaluation? So uh, that's a really good question. The question was, do you see any difference in patients who you have a chance to kind of prepare preoperatively versus patients who just come in urgently and go to surgery? Um, if I understood correctly, that, that's the question. So we don't have that data yet. And we actually, one of the biggest parts of cardiac ERAS and ERAS in general are prehabilitation, but the outcomes data on prehabbing a patient is, is essential, it's almost non-existent. There's a lot written about prehab, but there's not a lot of outcomes data showing that it makes things better. So that's an area of active research in, in ERAS in general. And, and cardiac is behind probably the newest kid on the block, so we have the least amount of data in that regard. You know, sort of piggybacking on the three comments here, the, the prehab and the um, smoking and alcohol cessation, um, that to me seems like almost the hardest part of, of the, the three um, tier <laughs> Um, ERAS program um, and almost the hardest to one have adherence to and be compensated for especially the prehab piece H how do you work that that's a, that's a really good question so first of all the way we worked it at St. Joe's is we left it out of our program 
<laughs> so I agree with you, it's one of the biggest pieces. We didn't do it, and I was the person who didn't want to do it because I said, look, we're not gonna do this halfway. And my vision for a prehab for St. Joe's is actually not limited to cardiac surgery. What I'd like to have is a, a pre-op optimization center for all patients going to surgery. And, um, and that takes capital investment and, and staff, and so I left that completely off the table. And, and, but, and this, it's interesting because we, we just submitted a manuscript about how to start an ERAS program in cardiac surgery. And basically we said, pick your care bundles very carefully. Look where you're gonna be successful locally. There's, there's 24 recommended care bundles, but only pick a fraction of those to start your program. <laughs> and, and pick things that are gonna be least controversial and you're gonna be successful. And for us at St. Joe's, we just didn't, weren't ready to do this like pre-op optimization clinic that I wanted to do, um, but we're still talking about. And I think we will do it at some point in the future. I think it's a huge piece. And I personally believe that it will have a huge impact on patients doing better, um, but we don't have that data yet to prove it. Uh, so that's something that, to keep in mind. But, but I agree with what you said. What's that? The, oh, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. the post-ICU syndrome. Which we did have a nurse at our, um, one of our nurses in the ICU applied for a grant and, and was awarded the grant and has started a PICS program uh, at St. Joe's where patients uh, who had an, a long ICU stay can just come and get support and, and, and help them with, uh, with any problems they're having, which is nice. Anything else? Intraoperative and postoperative parameters that change the outcomes, like duration of anesthesia, surgery, the nature of conduits, and the type of vein, how the veins are grafted. So I'm going to answer some of those questions uh, right now when I talk about. I'm going to talk about the ERAS program that we created for the University of Maryland medical system. We have three cardiac surgery programs in the Maryland system, and we all got together and um, had a consensus of what we would try to do. This is our ERAS team at St. Joe's, and I put this up just to impress upon you the kind of multidisciplinary, multi-professional nature of starting an ERAS program. We had everyone from the executive team, this is our CEO, uh, surgeons, uh, cardiac anesthesia, but you really need nursing directors, nurse managers, therapy, all allied health. You need some IT people. We had our intensivists on there. Uh, edu nursing education is critical. And uh, respiratory therapy, also very important. Uh, dietitian is on the team. Pharmacy. So it's really a lot of people involved. And these are the six care bundles that we put in our uh, ERAS program, and we sat down in about April 2018 to start working on this program. It takes about nine to 12 months to successfully plan and execute a new program. It took us about 10 months. Um, and our elements were simple, patient education. We completely revamped our patient education. Um, and now what we wanted to do from the start, and we just started now, was uh, this, in addition to the new binder that we have, we also have a web-based application that patients and their caregivers can access and uh, allows us to reinforce the education. So we avoid the prolonged fasting period, so we never keep people on NPL after midnight anymore. Uh, they, have a, they can have clear liquid diet after midnight up to two hours before surgery. And at two hours before surgery, we give them a carbohydrate load right before they go in the OR so that their body uh, is not in a starvation state right before it undergoes this big physical stress. And there's, there's some data to show that this actually improves outcomes. We prophylactically, we prophylax against post-op nausea and vomiting, which just helps get them back to a normal diet quicker. Also, you know, if people are nauseous, they don't want to ambulate, they really don't want to participate in their care. Um, and it decreases ileus. Uh, we have really focused on a multimodal pain management strategy, which I'll elaborate more on later, but it's allowed us to significantly decrease the 
uh, amount of opioids that we administer to our patients. We get them extubated early, and we get them moving as soon as possible. Our goal is to ambulate them three times a day, starting post-op day one. This was our rollout of our program. So in July 2018, we revamped our educational materials. We redid our order sets. And in December 2018, we created two electronic dashboards, two digital dashboards. One, to track our compliance with our own protocols. So if we said we're going to walk people three times a day, how often are we walking them three times a day? There's so many times we put a protocol out on the floor and we don't really know how often we're doing it. And then the other dashboard was just on hard outcomes. What are our five major complications? What's our length of stay? What's our patient satisfaction? And then some things related to cost and resource utilization. So, and those dashboards, by the way, we were insistent on creating dashboards that did not require any extra work by the frontline staff to input data. So all the data from these dashboards was harvested from our EMR, which was made it incredibly difficult to, to uh, just to, to create this. And we had to work with our Epic people. And you know, if you've ever worked creating something new with your Epic uh, people, it's a pretty convoluted process. There's like three different Epic teams. And, the first answer is always that they can't do what you're asking them to do. <laughs> um, in January 2019, we started educating all the frontline staff in the hospital, and we specifically waited to do this until right before we deployed because the education of the frontline staff on the ERAS principles is actually a big part of the program, and we wanted to be able to compare pre-ERAS to post-ERAS. And this actually, I was gonna, I wanted to start in the summer, but the nurses are the ones that told me, no, that we need to wait, because if you get everyone thinking about this and educating them, then you've already started the ERAS program. So we waited, we educated everyone in January, we had unit-based educational meetings, we had a nursing grand rounds, and we got everyone fluent in the culture of ERAS. And then we went live, February of 2019, so we just completed a year of ERAS. And I'll show you a little bit of our preliminary results. Uh, and then step six is continuous data review and quality improvement, which we meet twice a month to look at our dashboards. I'll just go over a few of the care bundles in a little more detail. So this is, as I said, we stopped uh, making our patients NPO after midnight. And about two hours before surgery, we have them drink this clear fast drink, which is maltodextran. It's a complex carbohydrate. It does create a spike. We give it to everybody, even diabetics. And it does create a spike in the glucose. But what's been shown is it actually makes perioperative glucose control um, better. It improves glucose control by increasing insulin sensitivity. It's shown to help patients have uh, earlier return of normal gut function, decreased ileus, and in cardiac patients, may uh, there's there's a couple of studies that showed that you may have less need for inotropic support after surgery. Uh, so this is something we've been very successful with. We use several agents to treat pain uh, and to minimize the need to give our patients opioids. So we're giving them around-the-clock gabapentin, around-the-clock Tylenol, and we use ketamine in the operating room. And then in, in a semi-unique uh, protocol, we use ketamine in our ICU until they're ready to go to the floor. So we keep them on a very low dose, continuous ketamine in the ICU. Uh, and then we use a lot of Presidex, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with, just a very ultra short acting sedative that you can extubate people on and allows them to be awake. Also has some analgesic properties. And we're very deliberate about the six care bundles that we chose so that uh, the steps of one bundle helped us be successful in the next step. So for, ex for instance, decreasing opioids uh, helped contribute to getting our patients extubated more quickly, which in turn leads to getting them ambulated more quickly, getting them discharged back home more quickly. This is a snapshot of actually one of our first, it's kind of changed a little bit since then, but this is one of our dashboards this data was all automatically harvested um, from our EMR, from Epic, and then displayed in Tableau, if anyone's familiar with that software. Um, and it helps us review 
things like readmission rates, length of stay, how many times patients are using their incentive spirometry, their total dose of narcotics, uh, which our goal is less than 50 morphine milligram equivalents, their pain score on each post-op day, nausea, blood utilization, prolonged vent, how quickly they're extubated, all the markers that we want to track for our ERAS program. This is another automatic list we created. This is something that comes up in Epic when you pull up your patient list that's in real time, and it tells you how many times you've ambulated your patient that day, how many times they've used their incentive spirometry, and it turns green when you get to the goal, so like three times a day is the goal here. It tells you if they're getting close to being a prolonged ventilation or if they've made their goal for getting early extubation under six hours, and it has some other metrics on it. So that's our University of Maryland ERAS program, which only has six care bundles, which is just only 25% you know, of all the recommended care bundles, but we want to start with something we could be successful with. Any comments about that? Or, Rich? Is that the uh, standard way of putting them to sleep or what they use or the drugs they use or anything like that? So the, that's a good question. So first yeah. of all, the anesthesia was a little resistant to the two-hour NPO, but if you look in the literature, which I never had before, but it, there's a ton of data that is no increase in aspiration risk with a two-hour NPO. And so um, they accepted that, and then we have not tracked our adherence. So they are supposed to have a standard regimen that they use that's based on ketamine. Ketamine is really the cornerstone of our like opioid reduction strategy. And they're all using it to some degree, but we have not tracked our compliance with the standardization. So it's, it's I see just from being in the OR that there's some variability in, in how they practice, probably affecting some of our excavation times and things. But in general, everyone's using the same agents. Do you see this working more in patients who are medically fragile at baseline who have cardiopulmonary renal um, chronic, this chronic critical illness versus someone who <coughs> had acute symptoms, was worked up, found a lesion, bypass was recommended, and they were pretty robust pre-op. Um, I mean, it, it, are you targeting, is this for everybody or is it targeted? So different programs do it differently. We apply it to everybody. And, and some people eventually will fall out of the program if they have a complication, but, but we still try to apply some of the principles where they apply. As to who benefits the most, we don't have that data, but you would think, you know, the low risk patients, there's certain patients that are going to do well almost no matter what you do, and, and, and that may be 75% of the patients we operate on, I don't know, it, it's a lot. But, but the minority of patients, there are things that we do that make a difference, and it's a, it's a substantial minority. I don't know exactly who benefits the most from ERAS, but you're probably, if I were just using logic, I think you're on the right track. I mean, people with multiple comorbidities who need to manage, people who are in pre-op heart failure have out of control diabetes or malnourished, those are the people who optimizing them will probably make the biggest difference, people who are anemic. Uh, so just a little bit about success with ERAS and cardiac surgery, a little bit of outcomes data. Uh, this is an abstract that we presented at the uh, STS critical care meeting this year about our uh, ketamine-based regimen to reduce opioid usage uh, in cardiac surgery. And we looked at our opioid usage in the first 24 hours after surgery, which is the, where the majority of opioids are used outside the OR. Um, and as I told you previously, this is based on, mostly on continuous ketamine usage, but also around-the-clock Tylenol and gabapentin. Uh, and then augmenting that with Presidex use. And we found within the first 24 hours a statistically significant drop in our amount of uh, fentanyl used um, with a p-value 0.01, um, a small drop in our oxycodone usage, but we don't use that much oxy in the first place in the first 24 hours. Uh, and then overall mean morphine equivalents, a statistically significant drop. That's converting all opioids to morphine equivalents, so you can just get the total opioid dose. 
Um, and that was comparing the blue is uh, patients before we started our ERAS protocol, and then orange is after ERAS. Wake Med, which I mentioned, had the first cardiac ERAS program uh, in the US, published their results, and they had similar, uh, similar experience in the first 24 hours. They had a 40% reduction in the amount of opioids that they were giving to their patients. <laughs> And you know, we're focused with the opioids on the short-term outcomes, getting them extubated, getting them discharged, getting them taking deep breaths. But obviously in the bigger context of what's going on in society, we know that patients prescribed opioids after surgery, uh, that some of those opioids end up in the hands of other people, or even for those patients can lead uh, to chronic habits. So decreasing opioids has multiple beneficial effects. <clears throat> Length of stay. Uh, we have not analyzed our length of stay data yet, but uh, Wake Med saw almost a 24-hour reduction in their ICU length of stay, and they saw a full day reduction in their overall hospital length of stay when they compared their post-ERAS patients to their pre-ERAS patients after one year. This is interesting data from Johns Hopkins, who has a cardiac ERAS program. They did not see a drop in their length of stay with their ERAS program. And I spoke to their ERAS coordinator. Um, they have a very um, aggressive ERAS program in multiple specialties and some really talented people working on it. They haven't seen a decrease in their length of stay in any of their programs. <clears throat> but I think this data, these data may show the reason for that. And, you know, Hopkins is a huge place with a lot of people. It's very difficult. Like, you really need your frontline staff to execute your ERAS program. It's very difficult to have success if the nurses and the CNAs and the RTs and the PTs are not fluent in the culture of ERAS and really embrace it. And I think at Hopkins, it's very challenging to change a culture because it's such a big place. So what they did is they reanalyzed their data and the blue kind of line or mark shows patients who were only compliant with either zero to four care bundles in their ERAS program. They had seven care bundles. And then the pinkish line or that red dotted line are the patients who were compliant with five to seven care bundles, meaning they were the patients that really received the ERAS treatment. And when they compared those two groups, they found a statistically significant difference in the length of stay between the highly compliant patients and the less compliant patients, which suggested that if you were able to be compliant with the program, you would see a decrease in your length of stay. Now we don't know, this is a little bit uh, flawed because we don't know why those patients weren't compliant, right? I mean, it may have been that they had a stroke and they were intubated for three weeks and that's why they weren't compliant. But it's interesting. This, I love this slide. This is from Wake Med again, and there's a surgeon there named Judson Williams who just does really great work. And, and he's got a great nurse manager that's become their ERAS coordinator that's really dedicated. And they, this is looking at a staff satisfaction survey. And this, is, this line in January 2017 represents when they deployed ERAS. And you see a big spike increase in staff satisfaction measured by patient focus, improves culture, and staff engagement. And this is, when I first saw this, uh, to be honest, I was pretty skeptical that URAS caused an increase in staff satisfaction. But after doing it for a year at St. Joe's, I completely believe in this because our staff loves ERAS. Like the, what happens is, nurses and every, all allied health people see the difference that they're making for the patients and, and it really gets them even more engaged in their work. So I, th I think this is a great benefit. Any comments? All right, there's more coffee over there and I made some muffins. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want to talk, I think you, you need to look at cost of care anytime you're talking about something new these days, particularly in Maryland, but really anywhere in the country. Um, so a little bit about healthcare costs. These are slides that many of you may have seen before. Um, this is looking at healthcare costs and inflation-adjusted dollars throughout 
uh, the decade since 1960. So 1960, 27 billion dollars sp spent on healthcare, which sounds like a lot to me actually, but uh, but doesn't really compare to 2010 when we spent two and a half trillion dollars on healthcare and expected this year to spend four and a half trillion, which is almost double what we were spending just 10 years ago. Put this in perspective, look at it another way. This gray line is, is the growth of our um, GDP, our gross domestic product since 1960. Our entire economy grew 168%, which is excellent. Um, but this is healthcare costs. It's grown 818% in the same time frame. And by the way, this is our wages down here. We've grown 16%. This is a slide showing where the healthcare dollars are going, at least in 2010. And it shows, I think the important thing here is that more than half the dollars are still going to clinical care, hospital care and physician and clinical services. <clears throat> so the same article that showed improved uh, outcomes and decreased length of stay showed a 30 to 50% reduction in costs at the hospitals that had ERAS programs. And we, when we look at cost in cardiac surgery, this is from the Virginia Quality Collaborative. And what they did was they looked at patients who just had uh, cavities, just had coronary artery bypass grafting. And they looked at patients that had no complications as their baseline case. And then they looked at complications, the five major complications, mediastinal infection, stroke, reop for bleeding, prolonged vent, renal failure, and mortality. Uh, and then AFib, which is very probably the most common complication. <coughs> and they looked at the at incremental cost um, for each of these cases, how much it added to each case, and, and it ranged from, you know, forty-nine thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars if you had a reop for bleeding, to sixty-three thousand dollars if you had a mediastinal infection. So we know from studies like this that post-operative complications add big increment of cost onto our cases. And again, looking at the outcomes in Maryland, this is the charges, uh, this is not risk adjusted, this is just gross charges for only isolated cavity surgery at all, uh, this is at nine programs in Maryland. One program was excluded because of numbers. Um, but this is a variability for the same operation just based on what hospital you go to. And we looked at our we actually presented this data um, at the Eastern Cardiothoracic Conference. We looked at our additive costs for complications in Maryland, and it turns out a stroke added $60,000. These are the four most expensive complications. And we found that these complications, they weren't the only cause for the charge variability, obviously, but the bulk of the variability in cost was because of differential um, occurrences of these complications at those hospitals. And this slide, I think, pretty much tells the story. These bars show the, uh, the incidence of those of the five major complications at each cardiac surgery program in the state. So they're all adding together. So the higher your bar, the more of all those complications you have. The gray line shows your charges for isolated cabbage. So it pretty much follows that the more complications you have, the more charges. So we know that if, if, if we could standardize the occurrence of complications, we would standardize the charges and, and probably decrease overall charges for the healthcare system in the state. Uh, and, and that's something we're actively working on at the state level as a collaborative by sharing best practice and also talking about ERAS. And then just, uh, a few more slides just talking a little bit about what we've done at St. Joe's regarding cost. Uh, as we focus more on efficient care and really just evidence-based care, it led us naturally uh, into transfusing uh, less blood. And we looked at one point, we looked back over a two-year period, <coughs> 2015 to 17, and we um, calculated our cost savings over that two-year period as a million dollars just in cardiac surgery. And we looked at our, we track our direct variable cost per case. So this isn't, this doesn't include the fixed cost in our case. So this isn't total cost per case for cabbage, but our direct variable cost for a cabbage at St. Joe's, 
2015 was about $20,000, which is not bad, um, but we've been able to shave a little bit off that each year. We're a little, uh, we're about 17.5,000 right now. And we continue to work on that. So that's basically the talk. We talked a little bit about, hopefully you understand what ERAS is, um, why, why I think ERAS is valuable and important thing to work on, some of the successes and a little bit of how it fits into the cost of care. Um, and just in conclusion, it's uh, evidence-based retooling of the way we take care of our patients to optimize patient recovery. question about post-operative care, post-discharge. One of the things as cardiologists we see is that even after people go home after cardiac surgery, they tend to have other problems. They have pleural effusions, sometimes they have pericardial effusions, sometimes they have wound problems, things like that. Is there a standardized way of sort of seeing them prophylactically so that they don't end up back in the emergency room, they don't end up, you know, to sort of save the, that cost of the readmission cost? So the readmission rate nationally for cardiac surgery is about 10% on average. And, and we looked at the Maryland rates, they range from about 6% to about 12%. Um, and we came up with tenants, we, we basically pulled the highest three performing programs and we asked them what they do to avoid readmissions. And uh, we came up with some basic tenets of avoiding readmissions. And it, it turns out if you go to a, if you don't go home, if you go to a subacute rehab, you have about twice the chance of getting readmitted for various reasons, some related to the patient. Um, but so one of our recommendations is for a handoff, either from a PA or a physician to the rehab team, verbally telling them what the issues with the patient are instead of just sending them with a written discharge summary. The other thing is, when a patient does come back to the ER, which you're already a little late trying to intervene at that point, always have the ER contact a member of the cardiac surgery team. It, and then the third, which may be the most impactful, is we, we noticed that the, the programs with the lowest readmission rates saw their patients back earlier. So we recommended seeing patients back in clinic within 10 days of discharge, which is unusual. We don't do it at St. Joe's. It's unusual, but a few programs do it, and I think it's a good idea. Most surgeons see their patients about three weeks after discharge. Uh, so we're, we're also hoping our new app, our web-based app, which allows us to ping patients, are you weighing yourself, are you taking your medications, is your glucose high, have you gained weight, will help us identify patients who may be at risk. Every day in the hospital, we have patients complain that they are fasting for procedures. And I understood that you didn't have an increase of vomiting and aspiration, uh, giving your solution two hours before surgery. So is it a myth that we need to keep these patients NPO? Are you pre-treating pre pre them with Zofran or scopolamine patch? Yes. So there's three aspects to that question. One is shortening the NPO period. There is absolutely um, abundant evidence that you don't need to keep people on PO for six or eight hours. Two hours is enough, and you don't increase the aspiration risk. We load the patients with a carbohydrate drink. That has been shown to be safe, but it, that's, if you, for, the first step is getting your anesthesiologist to accept the shortened NPO period. The carbohydrate load is kind of another thing that you can do. Um, the evidence behind that's not as robust, but it's been shown to be safe. If you do a carbohydrate load, someone's gonna ask, well, should we be doing this in diabetics? And there you have even less data. We do it in everybody. But those are like the three levels of shortening the MPO period. Um, and then as far as preventing nausea, we pre-treat everyone with Zofran. And in high-risk patients who are high-risk for post-op nausea, it's, uh, I think, young females, non-smokers, if they've had nausea before or after anesthesia, I think those are the criteria. Um, they get this drug called Emend, which is, I think, fairly expensive. We don't, we don't use it much, but it's apparently very effective in preventing that. One of the problems we have in our patients is basically compliance with some of the things that we ask them to do. 
and then your pre-op <laughs> pre uh, assessment requires a decent amount of responsibility on behalf of the patients, at least to optimize themselves. Um, is, if they are non-compliant, let's say with everything that you ask them to do, are they still followed by the ERAS program or is it uh, are they kind of dropped out of it? Well, we are, I mean, that's a humongous problem for everyone. And we're a little bit lucky in Towson. Uh, our population is, is relatively compliant, particularly compared, I think, to a more urban population. Uh, but we still have problems with that. And, and, and uh, you know, my philosophy is we try to get them to be compliant. But, and I think by preparing them pre-op and telling them what we expect and getting their, if they have a network of support, which they don't all have, getting them to be knowledgeable about what we expect, that helps. Um, but I always feel like whatever they do, they're still better off with us helping them than or whatever they do or don't do, you know. They're still better off getting some treatment than not. Is, is the ERS part of credentialing for surgical programs or uh Incorporated into the STS <clears throat> database. <laughs> good question. These are that's a really good question. So we are trying to get some of the elements, what we call it's a, a, actually another paper we submitted, are the essential elements of ERAS that people should be tracking if they have an ERAS program, because we're trying to standardize it for cardiac surgery, and uh, we are trying to get some of those elements into the STS database. Some of them are already there. But we're trying to get some other ERAS specific things. But the problem is at the same time, the STS database is trying to cut down the amount of work that data managers have to do. So we're kind of bucking the trend a little bit. So I don't know <coughs> what will happen there. It's not part of credentialing. We talked about like establishing ERAS centers of excellence, but the truth is it's a ton of work and we don't really have the bandwidth for it. I think our Maryland climate of reimbursement probably provides some unique challenges and opportunities. Can you yeah. elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. So our administration is very, they were semi-interested in this program, and then um, St. Joe's really took off with it, embraced it more than any other program in the system, and we saw a drop in our length of stay. Um, I don't have that <laughs> academically rigorous, like I don't have it to present, but they saw it in their administrative tracking. And they saw it on some system-wide administrator call and they asked our service line leader and he said, well, we're doing ERAS. And then everyone was really interested. <laughs> um, but it's also a challenge because we don't have like any money. Like we had a really fight to get this like web-based application, which was, we found one that was $20,000 a year, which most of them are like over 100, or like 80 to 100. Um, so that was a challenge. And then we don't have an ERAS coordinator. Like we have someone, but they're basically just doing it on top of their job. So, cause we didn't have money to fund that. So you have to kind of, get it started and improve the value, just like a lot of stuff. It's five after the hour, so five songs will be here for two more. Thanks, Rob. All right. Yep. That was nice.